Welcome to the Board of Select Meeting for Tuesday, April 23rd, 2019. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. On tonight's agenda, we have to uh, approve some meeting minutes. We have invited guests, uh, Mr. Wood, to, to, for an update on the Memorial Day activities. Uh, Matt O'Connell, for a request of a fee waiver. Uh, we have to approve uh, the summer farm sand license. Uh, wait, that one's not gonna be here. Kelly. We have a uh, street sign request. We're gonna discuss uh, annual scholarships. Uh, approval of the Northeast Super Agreement. We have to execute the warrant, uh, another discussion for uh, some help that the town manager got us, and uh, set May meeting dates. Does anyone make a motion for the uh, April 2nd meeting? Uh, make a motion that we approve the regular session meeting minutes from April 2nd. I second that. Yeah, unanimous action. <clears throat> Mr. Wood. Okay. I'm here uh, on the inviting to participate in the Memorial Day exercises on May 27th, starting at 0800 in the morning. Sir. Also participate in the uh, parade. I'm from the Veterans Council. And Thank you. You can bring the uh, readings of the town, I'd be much appreciated. Thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, do you have any questions for Mr. Wood? Um, I participated in the last couple of years, so I'm assuming the the format's about the same. About the same, yes. Okay. We have a special a special uh, tribute for Doug. Okay. Oh, very good. Okay. Thank you. That's great. Well, thank, thank you. Very, thank much. You. very quick. I didn't expect to be that. See you there. Mm -hmm. Thank you as always. Thank you, Sarah. And you're good for the welcome speech. Is that the one? I thought he wanted Memorial Day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Since you covered it last year. I don't want to make sure you don't change your mind. So that's the greetings of the town, right? Yes. Yeah. 1030. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Wow, that was quick. Uh, our next to uh, all is Mr. O'Connell here? Matt? Uh, Matt is not here. Okay, here's Mr. Okay, here he is. Attorney? I am. Okay, come forward, sir. I'm just going to read what you're here for. Uh, Mr. O'Connell. Actually, his attorney is here tonight to appeal a decision made by the town's DPW to assess a $4,000 water connection fee for his property at 3 Centennial Court. Mr. Connell feels since he already has a service, he shouldn't have to pay for an additional line. Yeah, that's correct. So my name is Michael Robbins. I'm an attorney. I represent Matt Connell. Um, Matt is a local uh, up and resident and business owner. He has been for over 20 years. And the issue at hand is the water connection fee. The, the issue that I see is that the property is already served by an existing line. Um, Mr. Canal had applied for a permit to renovate Centennial Court. And as part of that permit, there was a fire, there was a requirement to tie into fire suppression. Um, I argue that the fire suppression is not a listed fee on the uh, DPW's list of selected fees, so there's a breakdown of those fees, and fire suppression tie-in is not listed on that fee, and I would argue that uh, perhaps the board did not contemplate fire suppression connection fees when they authorize uh, those fee, that fee schedule. Um, there's a case, the Emerson College for, uh, versus Boston, as well as the Division of Local Services User Fee Memorandum dated 2016. I have a copy of both of these. These set forth that a fee must be collected not to raise revenues per se, but to compensate the government entity for its expenses in providing the service. This has been interpreted to mean that a fee cannot exceed the cost of providing the service. I'm contending that the connection of a fee for a fire suppression system to an existing line for $4,000 is not the actual reflected cost for that. As we know in, in town, there's been a fire recently right next to 
uh, Matt's property. Uh, a resident passed away in that fire. I would argue to the board that fire suppression is a public good, um, that it, this should be encouraged by town residents and builders, and it shouldn't be discouraged by excess fees. The cost of this tie-in fee is 25% of the overall system, and it's acting as a penalty, and it's a chill on, in this case, Mr. Cannell's uh, desire to move forward with this project. It goes to financial feasibility, and I feel that it is inconsistent with the approved fees as well as just if we want fire suppression, well, we shouldn't be penalizing people that are putting this in. And I don't think it's consistent with the actual costs. And I think that that cost is excessive for what's needing to be done. We're requesting uh, my client, if there was a reasonable fee to have this connected to his existing line, that's fine. But for four thousand dollars, we feel that that's excessive. Do you know what size main goes into the building now? What's that? Do you know what size water main runs into that building now? Um, I know. I believe it's undersized and it has to be updated. Right. Yeah, but I, I don't know the exact size, so I don't want to. What what type of system is he putting in? The fire suppression system. 13R, 13D. I don't have that. <coughs> I could get that information and respond to you if you like. I'd also like to know what size main they have to put in because um, you would think if they have to run this main, it's just not like a connection. You would think this would, it's a brand new connection altogether. Right, right. but so on one hand, the town is saying, hey, Matt, if you want to reconfigure this property, you need to do this. Oh, and by the way, it's an additional 4,000. And so, again, it's a disincentive. Do you want fire suppression or do you want the fee? Because Matt is literally like, you know, I'm, I'm just looking at the numbers of this project and it's just not financially feasible to pay literally a quarter of the cost for a fee. So, and again, I would argue that the connection does, does is that consistent with what needs to be done and I would argue that it does not. Now, are we talking about the building right directly behind the tan building? Uh, I believe it's the building behind, yep, Three Centennial Court. Now is, it, is he gutting it and re-venerating it, or is he putting an addition on it? No, so what uh, my understanding is that it's a multi-use dwelling, uh, multi-unit dwelling, and this was in conjunction with his petition to uh, renovate one of the units. I think it was a two-bedroom unit to, to make it a single, uh, few single-use properties. And so in conjunction with that, Okay, you need to tie into fire suppression, and oh, by the way, here's four thousand dollars. Any questions? Uh, yes, I do have a question. I actually had a, an opportunity to speak with Mr. Connell. Um, actually, talked to our DPW director um, and actually our building inspector, and I'm still having a tough time trying to figure out whether it's going to be a separate connection or trying to actually rebuild and increase the size of the existing connection. That's the part that I. I'm not unsure of. So are we, is he planning on bringing in a separate line into the building? Fire suppression has to be a dedicated separate line. That, no, it is. no that's not the case? I thought that, I, it was my understanding. Oh, okay, so I'll, I'll, de I'll, I'll, de I'll defer to you on that. I was, uh, my understanding of the case law was that they didn't want the water to get shut off and that uh, most municipalities insist on having a separate line, but certainly I defer to your interpretation Cities of the code. Cities do have two separate lines, a fire line in the, system, in the street and also domestic. Okay. The fire, that's where they get the two lines. Okay. So you're not allowed to go into a domestic, if you have two lines in the street, right. with a fire line. Okay. It goes to the, which has the hydrants on it. But in the suburbs, they don't have to have two connections. And I think that town or any water department today would be hard pressed to shut off water into a multi-family building for one connection. Okay, so that was the concern, right? Building. Exactly. Uh, you know, my uh, the ideal condition is to bring in a single main. The one he has there now is not adequate. I can space my okay on that to supply a sprinkler system for that building. So a new main would have to be put in. Uh, probably, I think he was talking about four inch. I think if that's being overdone, it can go two and a half, maybe three inch. But that is calculated by the number of heads that are put in the building. Okay? And it's hydraulically calculated to tell you what size main you do need for the water supply available. So 
do have a lot of water, good pressure down there. So I would say, yes, two and a half to three inches of max to tie into the tree. My idea would be just to continue the main you have there now for a new one and to split it in the middle. Uh, water purveyors have a hard time with that, but they do it all the time. You put a double check assembly on the sprinkler side. A successful double check assembly is the water cannot get back into the purveyor's supply. There's magic water. Did that address your question? <laughs> a little so more detail than I was looking for. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Uh, Mr. Roach, you want to come forward, sir? Uh, I must, Mr. Roach, you want to come forward in case we have any more questions? So you were saying, does he need a backflow preventer with this? Uh, Definitely, any, yes. Yeah, any, any, anything he does down there is going to need a backflow preventer. And what's the yearly fee on a backflow preventer? That is up to the water purveyor. Okay. And don't forget the, the biannual inspection. Yes. It will have to be done. Now, I don't know if it counts twice a year or one in the Now, if you run two separate uh, lines, do you still have to have the annual inspection or the biannual inspection? Uh, the water department will do the fire protection line. That's what it will be on the double check assembly. There's two check valves. If one fails, the other one holds it. And that, what, that, that test every year just wants to check to make sure that uh, the backflow is still operating and nothing is under the check valve. But to answer your question, Mr. Chairman, if they run two separate lines, you don't have to do the annual inspection because there's no backflow coming. The two Not separate lines, they're not connected in any way. But yes, you need, on the fire protection line, you need a backflow preventer. In the building? In the building. If he runs two lines, domestic doesn't need a back, uh, fire protection, does need a backflow preventer. Yeah, it's going to, you know, the cross connection would be in the street then, not inside the building. Yeah. So whether it's teed off in the building or the two separate lines, you would still be subject to the testing fee yes, yes. biannually? Yes. Okay. Any questions, Mr. Simon? Can you just give me the context again? So this is a multi-unit dwelling? That's correct. That's being converted into... So there was a... I think so in, what is going in, on exactly? So what's going on is that in the building there was a two-bedroom uh, rental unit for residential. So a single two-bedroom rental unit. Correct. Single-family home or multi-family? No, it's a multi-family home, and this is one, I want to say six off the top of my head. I think it's five and he is wants it, to add can, That's right. It's five and he wants to add six. Okay. And so what this was done was, was to divide a two-bedroom unit into uh, two single one-bedrooms because there's more demand for the one-bedroom. Yeah. He had uh, applied for a permit to have this done, obtained the necessary approvals, and then got hit um, with the fire, like, okay, we'll allow you, but you need to add fire suppression. Yeah. Uh, there was an eight month delay. Uh, he was waiting for permit approval from the former fire department chief. There was an eight month delay on that. Mm -hmm. And again, he's been pushing back on the fee because again, his position is that this is an existing line Fire suppression is a public good. There's already two lines going to the building? No, there's a the current water line now. Fire suppression is. Adding a line? That's the. They would that, have to add a line, yes. So that's what the but fee a fire is for, suppression. adding a second line? That's it. And so, okay. in, in his position, he goes, well, if it's going to be this much money to add fire suppression, then I really don't necessarily need to do the project. I mean, that's right. That's up that's, to That's up to him. To, sure. But, yeah. but again, that's, that's not the business of the board, what kind of projects people do. It's our job to assess the fee or assess the validity of the fee certainly, based but, on the situation that's arisen, which is you're adding a second line to an existing dwelling. But it's being served. And the, the fee schedule for the water connection is for adding new lines. Exactly. And you're adding a new line. Right, but there's an existing <laughs> there's an existing line there. Yes, and you're so, adding another one. So when Pulte adding home, another line? That's what that's the that's the requirement from the town. Okay. So that seems pretty cut and dry to me. But is that the actual cost for this service? There's a four thousand dollar fee for a water line connection. This is a water line connection. So there's this a is a fire suppression. Line. This is for fire suppression. <laughs> but it's not a new type of water line connection then for well, if you're, like going to use his, if you're going to use his uh, domestic water supply. In terms of the installation supply, cost, I apologize. You know what in I mean? terms of the installation, does it cost a different amount of money to install a fire suppression hookup? Than in a domestic a one? Hookup? No. To an existing, the same, to an existing, existing one? It's a wet tap on the main. That's all it is. Well, it's, you know, so, so, so it's the same process. 
So why would the fee yeah. be different for the same process? Because the town wants to encourage fire suppression. Do you want to have fire suppression or do you want the fee? It's not up to us whether we want it or not. It's up, no, to, it's, the, it's up to the private homeowner. No, but is, it, but is it a public good? Do you, do you want it? That requires fire suppression or not. You, the you, argument here isn't about whether we want fire suppression or not. The argument is about is. the fee. I think it's both. How so? Because if the town overall, the, if, the, if the public safety is in question and you want to encourage people to tie in to fire suppression and add fire suppression as a public good by adding fees, it's a chill on the process. So then we would never charge people a connection fee for putting in fire suppression. I would say that you should consider a fire connection fee for a list of fee schedules because it's not currently listed. Right, but it's covered under the water connection fee. I disagree. Well, that's what we're here for. That's right. I, I suggested a reduced fee to encourage fire protection, you know, if there's already on existing buildings, not on new construction now. On existing buildings, somebody wants to tie into it a reduced fee for fire protection. Um, which would my, my, my you know, that's, that's, that's up to you people to make that decision. But my, you know. my concern is that if we go around arbitrarily reducing fees for developers and homeowners and private property owners and business owners, that it's a slippery slope for us to then, as a board, be stuck in the position of saying, well, sometimes we charge the fee, sometimes we don't charge the fee, sometimes we make up the fee. That doesn't seem like a good way for the board to conduct itself. I think if there's an argument to be made here about changing the fees for fire suppression, it should come up with the water purveyor, they should assess the fees, we should make a decision based on that, and we should enforce a policy. Our job as a board is to look at each situation, to understand the policy that's in place, and to make a decision based on what current, what the current policy is, separate from a debate about whether or not we should change the policy. That's not our position, that's not what this board is for in this context. In this context, our job is to assess a fee, or assess the validity of a fee for an existing project based on an existing policy that exists. And so if we're looking at putting in a second water connection, there's a water connection fee. It is what it is. It's not for us to arbitrarily change that. Is it when you, when you decide to go from five to six, doesn't that change the, uh, doesn't that make it mandated for sprinkler systems? In that area, it does. Yeah. yeah. So he chose to upgrade his building too, to add that bedroom. He, he hasn't done that yet. Yeah. No, he hasn't it, done it. He, he's applied for a permit, but we refused it. Uh, because so of there isn't even the town's forcing them to put a fire protection system. It's the building code, from what I understand. Th that area, it is. That's why we're insistent. We didn't make that up. You know what I'm saying? The, but, the but, to your, but to your point, sir, the town in the past, with respect to developments, has negotiated lower fees with developers for connection fees. Mm -hmm. So, was, wasn't that the case? Wasn't that the case with Pulte Homes? Uh, wasn't there? We did negotiate fees, but they were for 40B units. So he was willing to do 40B units. So, but my point is, is that fees were negotiated. And I think it is reasonable to have a reduced fee for an existing line. I think based on what I'm, what I'm hearing, it would really be more, I think to be fair to all parties involved, reading the background information uh, where this fee, you know, has and been, you know, more or less consistently charged in the past, it would really require a change of policy, I think, more than anything else. I think we just charged um, to Cross Street, I believe. I yeah, think I think that's the example that was given, so I guess... Uh, well, because of the 40B units, they reduced it. That's all. Not the other units. There's 125 units, 130 right. units. Could be. The affordable, so you, the you affordable you units, that's it. You want to make six affordable units in town? We can have that conversation. So my, See, point, my, point, is, my, my point is, is that fees were negotiated. So, okay, so you chose to negotiate with Pulte for whatever reasons. My town, my client's a local resident, has been here for over 20 years. He feels that $4,000 to assess for an existing line is unreasonable and we're asking for a reduction of fee. The board has the ability to do that. And I think that's reasonable seeing as that they've given reduction to an outside company. Here's a local resident and business owner. You're giving a company uh, preferential treatment as opposed to local resident. That's. You gonna make that a 40B unit? No, that, that's not the case. Those, but my point is, he is in a large oh, development. Well, we'll be fair. We did it for one 40B unit. We'll do it for another. But yeah, I would. Then you have to say that. 
So anyone who wants to see the board for a connection fee has to con have to convert it to 40B. Do they have a multifamily house? Nope, that's not what we're saying. Okay. Well, that's not what I'm saying. Okay. I would think it would be a good idea to take this under advisement. We can discuss this more, do a little more background information, unless you gentlemen have a different uh, plan of attack. I'm ready to vote whenever we want to, but we certainly can take more time if that's what the gentleman would like to do. It's up to you. You guys want to vote? I'm ready to vote. You want to make a motion? Yes. Um, so what is the motion? Well, I make a motion that we uh, institute the fee as written uh, as the policy mandates for uh, the property on, in question. For three Sentinel Fort. I'll second the motion. Is it on the section? I'm going to keep it at $4,000. There it is. Thank you for your time. for a, uh, our annual common vic for Kelly's farm stand. Um, this will be contingent on a board of health inspection and a um, code of order. Other than that, okay. everything else has been paid. Okay. Uh, this is pretty straightforward. Any discussion? Can't wait to go, no? <laughs> <laughs> Spring is here. All right. Um, I'll make a motion that we approve the common vic license for Kelly's farm, Kelly's family farm. Second that. That's a unanimous action. And then our next one is a uh, street sign request. Uh, this is from both the uh, DPW and the Upton Police Department. They're asking for a, a board to authorize a no parking sign on Farm Street near the entrance of Millhouse Apartment. The reason being is that traffic is blocking, uh, has been parked on both sides of Farm Street uh, since the opening of uh, Stephanie's. Uh, the street is very narrow in that area and uh, emergency vehicles and through traffic is having trouble uh, navigating that area. They would like to make the side that has the uh, Solid concrete wall and no parking. That way, there's more access for through traffic. <coughs> okay. There's some pictures in our. Uh, <coughs> yeah, I was going to say on the website there are some pictures of when it's busy. The road is fairly narrow there. It's uh, you know, more or less across from the Council of Aging. Yep. So uh, this seems like a reasonable request to me. Put forward by the uh, police chief. And the DPW director? Yeah, did the police chief and DPW director look at it? Yes, they, they did. Yeah, yeah they're supportive. Yeah. Okay. Excuse, excuse me, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Is it the whole street? No, just that area where the big cement is, right in this area. Right here. Where the concrete wall is in the front. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, there's a section of fence on top of that as well. Yeah, it gets real narrow. I was right going to say that just is, that's just a pinch point where that concrete wall is just sort of narrows the street in that section. Oh, it's, and it's just on the weekends, yeah. really, is when it's bad. It's upside down in the email, but I was able to find it. So, yeah. Okay. Good. I'm good with it. Yeah. Can I make a motion. I will. Uh, make a motion that we approve the request by the DPW director and chief of police to have the two no parking signs along uh, Farm Street, I believe that is, uh, as, as indicated in the photos. <laughs> Unanimous okay. action. Okay. Thank you. <sighs> Next is the scholarship. So next is the annual scholarship applications. Um, tonight we have the opportunity to, to award some high school seniors with scholarships. Uh, these students will be awarded $500 scholarships from the we're going to do it from the Ristine B Welfare Trust Fund. Read the names off and tell me whether you have them or not. Yeah, I think it's the numbers, right? Yes, that's what I meant, the numbers. Yep. Yeah. Um, you have a number yeah. one? Uh, number one? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Number two? Yes, I have number two. Oh. Same. I got number three. Uh, yes. yes, you have that one. I actually have four, five, six, and seven, so I'll make it quick. Uh, yep. yep. 
I do like the Winston Churchill quote on number five. So that young lady is listening. Very well done. Good. Yep, yeah, I'm good with all of those. Okay. Uh, yep. Make a motion that we approve the $500 scholarships to the uh, applicants that we just uh, discussed. So numbers 765432 and number one. Not in that order. And that will be out of the Rustine B, I believe it is. Yes. Mm -hmm. clarify that for people watch. So this is a scholarship that the Board of Selectmen does every year for a group of students that apply for a scholarship. And this year we're doing, uh, is it seven $500 scholarships from the Ristine B uh, Trust Fund that is uh, family money that's part of a trust that is not town money, so it's not taxpayer money, it's money that's paid for out of this family trust. And so these, there were seven candidates. The numbers we were referring to correspond with applicants that have applied for these scholarships that we've now decided have earned these scholarships of those that applied. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brett. Yeah. You're welcome. You got away with words. <laughs> <laughs> and congratulations to the students. Well done. Great, great work. Yeah. A lot of effort goes into these applications, so it's nice to see it, and it's a pleasure to read these. Yeah. Next is the approval of the Northeast Reevaluation Group Agreement. Um, so you there? Yeah, I can I can speak to it. Sure. Can tell you say that answer, answer any technical questions. So uh, the town went out to bid um, for uh, property tax assessment services uh, this past winter, and we selected Northeast Reval uh, for a total cost of sixty-eight thousand dollars for the period of uh, May first, twenty nineteen, to December thirty-first, twenty twenty-first. Have we uh, used this company in the past? Yes, it's the same company we've been using. Oh. There's not a lot of vendors out there. So you only have made every five to the hour and we've been using them for at least 10 years. Okay. Um, okay. How often do we reassess the market values? We're always doing, um, it's every year mm -hmm. we do uh, an assessment on values, but every five years we're required by the state to do a full How do we make the adjustments every year? Is that the company comes in and they do sort of a market adjustment based on comps and market and yeah. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And are the dollars pretty consistent <coughs> with where they have been in the past for that period of time? It was a little bit more than it has been in the past for every year, but they're doing more work for us. So the board of assessors looked at it and felt as if it was reasonable, and the finance committee approved it for our budget for this year. And then keep in mind every year we do the article um, for eleven thousand dollars, and that money will go towards the third year of this contract. So that money will already be baked, for lack, for lack of better term. So we'll have the funding for the, for the last year of the contract. Okay. This may seem obvious, and it's a bit of an unrelated, but it's not specific to the to what's on the agenda. Is you know, cause I've, I know from talking with citizens that sometimes house valuations go up while other ones in town go down, and and vice versa. So, is that based on comparables that are sort of in that area, or based on price range, or so? The more expensive house might come down a little, the less expensive house might go up a little, and it depends on what other sales happen in that neighborhood. Or just help me understand why that would happen. Okay, I wish my counterpart Bill Taylor could explain it a lot better than I can. However, it's based, we do a mass valuation, so it's not Massachusetts valuation, it's a mass valuation, so it's all put into a formula and to a table mm -hmm. in order to determine the values, and it's all based on actual sales that happened the previous years. Got it. Um, so that's what happens on a yearly basis, mm -hmm. and so that's why ranches from this past year went up like by 26%, mm -hmm. but some of the colonials might have stayed the same or went mm -hmm. down a little bit because ranches last year sold for much value than they were assessed at. Got it, got it. 
and it's Northeast Reevaluation Group that maintains all that data, the Correct. database, and does that they assessment work extensively every year. with the state to make sure that uh, the tables that we use for that all evaluation are updated on a, yeah. on a yearly basis. And Great. I think they have probably five or ten other communities in Massachusetts. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. Any other questions? No, I have nothing else. No. No. Do we need to make a motion? Or yes. 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 Uh, I make a motion that we uh, approve and authorize the Northeast Reevaluation Group Agreement for $68,000. Second the motion. It's a unanimous action. <coughs> so our next agenda item is to execute the state warrant for election warrant for May 14th. Any questions about the state? Um, seems pretty straightforward. Yeah. Straight to me. We have a couple of hotly contested races, and the rest, I think, is pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. so. No, I don't think so. I think it's built into the budget box. <laughs> I, I just, if I could, I just wanted to bring to folks' attention because there hasn't been a lot of discussion about it. We've been focused mostly on the budget and preparation for town meeting, but as you all remember, at the November town, uh, annual, uh, special town meeting in 2018, the, the town meeting members voted to prohibit retail marijuana sales. And so as you can recall, in order to make that um, law, it also had to go to ballot. So this is a ballot question that is gonna be in front of the voters uh, this coming election. So I know most people are probably going to polls to vote for the, for the local election campaign, uh, but I don't want folks to be surprised when the question is asked of whether or not folks want to prohibit retail marijuana here in town. And so, that being said, this is my kind of first public announcement of that, but additionally, we're gonna be messaging the community via our typical strategies of messaging, um, social media, websites, so on and so forth, just so people realize that this may be a reason for folks to just to come out to the polls just for that reason alone. And this is more or less to reinforce what we, uh, what we voted on back in November. To reinforce, yes, but if, if you remember, at the state election when uh, recreational marijuana was passed, it also passed in Upton at 52 to 48 percent. So that's why, again, we have to go back to holding a local election. So if it does not pass in May, at the May 14th election, it's going to require the town to at least minimum hold a special town meeting before July 1st so that we can zone this properly. Because if it doesn't pass, then that will mean that retail marijuana can take place here in town. Okay. And I think that the the simplest way to put it, and I think, I mean, just to restate or recap what you said, right? The ballot question is about banning retail marijuana in Upton. So if you don't want retail marijuana shops in Upton, then you're gonna vote for the question. If you do want retail marijuana shops in, in Upton, then you're gonna vote against the question. That's right. So that's, it, you know, it's that simple. There's a lot of other implications with zoning and what we have to do from a process perspective, if it does pass or doesn't pass, but I think making it as simple as possible for voters is, is the key and we'll deal with whatever the repercussions are based on what the town votes for. And clearly the town did vote to ban retail marijuana in the town meeting in, in the fall, which is why this ballot question has been raised. So I will make a motion that we uh, execute the election warrant. Yes, Michelle. I'm sorry, thank you. Michelle, you just want to report you yourself. Sure. Sorry, does this have to count for the two-thirds majority or is it a simple majority? It's just a simple majority election. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? No. So uh, I will make a motion that we execute the local election warrant. Second the motion. State election warrant, I should say. Is that a unanimous action? <laughs> Is that considered the state or the local? Oh, and this one there would be no, right. You're saying state, but I'm wondering if I use it if I typed it wrong. That's right, there's no uh, state ballot on this, right? State. Annual election. Annual ballot. Okay, Our next is to uh, discuss a request <laughs> from the uh, town manager, there's a two vote. For, so Mr. Uh, Mendezi reached out to the Department of uh, Division of Local Services and they're willing to do us some uh, service, some work on finances for free. And um, we just have to authorize this. But since you did all the work, I'll let you explain it. Yeah, so I spoke to Zach Blake. He's the chief um, of the Technical Assistance Bureau of uh, Division of Local Services. And 
we had a conversation after, after I had attended a presentation um, that he had conducted for the Mass Municipal Association. And so they offer free technical assistance to municipalities um, in the areas of doing five-year financial forecasts. So looking at our revenues over five years, looking at our expenditures over five years, and, and trying to marry those two so we kind of have a sense of where we're going in the next five years. Um, they're also willing to help us do a capital planning analysis, looking at our capital uh, budget plan, uh, looking at the capital needs that are coming forward. And then lastly, so one thing you folks may remember is that this last year's, this past year's budget presentation back on January 15th was very different than the years prior. So we had, you know, thanks to Kenny Costa, uh, with Town of Con, we had a lot of graphs, ch pie charts, uh, revenue projections, so on and so forth in that budget. And that's really to try to get us to a point where, you know, we're, we're meeting best practices. So the state's willing to come in and look at things that we're doing now and provide recommendations so we get to a point where, you know, we're meeting expectations of what a sound municipal um, financial program looks like. Um, and then looking at some of our policies. So, you know, we worked with uh, the uh, Finance Committee. Uh, they have approved a reserve policy. Um, so we have other financial policies that we would ask them to take a look at and then again provide best practice recommendations. So again, we are paying attention to kind of the evolving market and, and doing the things that um, the state and, and other national organizations would think uh, a local municipality should be doing when it comes to finances. So they're really, they, in order for us to get that assistance, we need to, um, I need a vote by the Board of Selectmen and then I need to go ahead and then request that to the state and they'll put us in a queue. They're probably thinking at this time if we uh, put in a request, maybe the end of uh, the summer time period is as soon as I can get here because they're working with a lot of other municipalities as well right now. And they, so they'll come, they'll come in, do the analysis, meet with people, I would assume get information, look at our finances, look at our budget, look at our capital plan, and then come back with a set of recommendations. Right. Are we obligated in any way whatsoever to take any of those recommendations or, I mean obviously we would debate them and discuss them and right. make any decision, but we're not obligated to do anything based on this free service? There's no obligation, no. We're not tied into it. These are just simply recommendations. Yeah, I mean, that would be my only concern. I feel like we have an awful lot of policies in place. We have a policies and procedures manual right now. We have a pretty good capital, uh, capital improvement plan, uh, and I just hate to introduce more and more paperwork, more and more documentation, more and more things that pigeonhole the board. I feel like the board should have uh, some flexibility, you know, to match what we're hearing from our residents versus, you know, what a, a document or a piece of paper tells us we should spend or do. So that's the only thing that, you know, worries me. It seems like any time we get the state involved, uh, you know, we have a study done, it's always to spend more money. And uh, as you may be surprised to hear, that tends to irritate me. But it is free. It's free, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's free information. It just seems like nothing's free. I don't know why. <laughs> Pay for that, your state. The state always it. seems to get, to, you know, so get the money Derek, out of is somehow. there a way that this could cost us money, to Mr. Metellian's point? Is there any... Cost us money? Well... Or tie his hands? Well, I... Well, I don't think it would tie anyone's hands. Again, at the end of the day, it would be the decision of the Board of Selectmen whether or not they want to take these recommendations and move forward. And then, again, working with the Finance Committee and the Capital Budget Committee, it's just ask the question, does this make sense? You know, given our current financial condition, couldn't we implement some of these? Maybe it's some of these recommendations we implement over a five to six year period, you know, because we don't have the ability to do them right away. So, you know, I was just saying, I was just going to say, you know, for me, it's just, to have an outside organization come in here who do this every single day and throughout many municipalities, you know, they're seeing things that we, ha we haven't seen before and I think that they kind of would give us a fresh set of eyes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I tend to agree with that. I think for me, all information is always good, especially when it's free. Um, and I have seen consultants come in in a way, in this similar type of environment and actually reduce the amount of paperwork because they see things that are redundant, repetitive, or unneeded, or duplicative, and they say, you know what, you can pull this policy out here, you can pull it out here, and, and make things a little bit simpler and cleaner for the town. So, you know, there's always that aspect of it as well. But to your point, it, it, we have to be very careful and look at these things with a very cautious eye when we get these recommendations in, because what's great for other counties or other towns or other municipalities might not necessarily make sense in Upton, but that's really the job of the board. Right. I don't think there's any harm in not trying. So it's a free report for five years. Okay. Or an outlook, I should say. 
Anything else? No, I'm also. No, I, make a motion. I make a request that we approve the, or make a motion that we approve the, approve the request for assistance from the Division of Local Services. Uh, second the motion. That's unanimous action. Our next agenda item is uh, discuss the meeting phase schedule, or discuss the meeting schedule for May. God bless you. You okay? So uh, the question is, do you guys want to meet uh, May 7th at Tuesday after town meeting or play it by ear or wait till after town election? I mean, I guess it depends on whether or not there are things that we have to put on the agenda. You know, if we have a sense of... We don't, have, we don't have anything scheduled right now. I was going to say, it's obviously a very busy time for all of town hall, including, you know, ourselves included. So... Um, I think unless we feel like there's some town business that's timely or where time is of the essence, then I don't feel compelled to, to squeeze a meeting in, in the middle of a town meeting in a town election. That's just my we'll, uh, two we will We will meet before the town meeting. Yeah. Here. So I guess what we could do is if we feel like there's some impending business that needs to be handled by the board, instead of meeting at 6 o'clock in advance of town meeting, we could just meet a little bit earlier. Maybe 5.30 if there were some procedural issues. Right, we something administrative care. we needed to take care of. Yeah, and that yeah. may take care of, that would alleviate the yeah. 7th. And just so it's clear for people, the meeting before the town meeting is a posted public board of selectmen meeting where we get together before the town meeting just to prepare and make sure we're sort of crossing all the T's and dotting all of the I's and all that so that meeting will be posted with an agenda. Right, typically go over the motion cards and consult with legal. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And if something big happens, Derek can just email us and then... Right. Sandy could just put up next week and of course and we'll just meet on the seventh. Of course. So yeah, okay. So I think we for forego the meeting on the seventh. Tentatively. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Unless something big happens. Yeah. Right. So if we don't meet on the seventh, I guess we have to figure out, you know, the election is the following Tuesday, correct? Yes. Yeah. So when would we meet after the twenty first? Twenty first. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, we would need to reorganize the board, I guess, would be the only thing. So I don't know what that would, be the would make any sense. We have to wait after the town election. It's got to be right. after the election anyway. Unless you know right. something we don't. No, I'm just thinking as long as pushing that meeting out, it'll be a busy schedule. But that's fine. That's fine with me. Yeah. We're we used to staying late, right? We can meet earlier if we need to. I'm not. I mean, I'm happy to meet. The seventh or any yeah, other. We day. need to meet the seventh. We meet the seventh. Oh. But now it's the twenty-first. Second. Twenty-first. Okay. Okay. Anything for the? Uh, the second. The second. There you go. Exactly. Thank you for doing that. Uh, do you have a talent manager's report tonight? Uh, sure. I have a few things. Can we just recap that for everybody? Okay, so uh, oh, go right ahead. So we're, we're, the board's going to meet May 2nd prior to the annual town meeting. Um, if there is no impending business, then we're going to have the next meeting on May 21st. Should something need to be discussed, then we will have a meeting on May 7th. But as of now, there will be no May 7th uh, meeting. Thanks. Thank you. Well done. No. Really getting the hang of that. <laughs> 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 three years. Great. Uh, you, it's all you, Mr. Town Manager. Okay. So, um, just a couple of quick um, budget numbers, because um, I know I'm always asked where are we with snow and ice, and so um, according to the DPW director, all invoices have been turned in, and um, our town account has crunched the numbers, and so. Our motion at town meeting for snow and ice will be $52,000. So we have a deficit of $52,000, which is very different than the previous two years where we were well into the six figures. Um, any questions regarding that? So I'll keep moving. Nope, keep going. Um, many of you may uh, have noticed that the house budget came out a couple of weeks ago. It's now being debated uh, on the floor. And um, typically, the, the house budget um, it only gets better. And so if things stay the way they are in the house budget, 
we will be positive an additional $37,000 in state aid. <coughs> additional? An additional $37,000 in state aid. Okay. Yep. 37. Um, <coughs> moving on to um, town meeting. Uh, this was developed last week. Uh, Cindy did a great job developing this, and we've been trying to distribute this, uh, this kind of central town meeting information um, town-wide. Uh, if you went to this electronically, it has a bunch of links on it. It takes you to the FinCom report, it takes you to the, the warrant, um, it takes you to the annual report, and then as many of you may have seen, the seven videos that were created um, by a local firm that's Dad Kelly and a fire chief and DPW director and folks from the EDC. So again, we're trying, I guess the point is we're trying to do as much as we can to get the message out and try to make things easier for folks to get all the information that they can need. And so again, always open to recommendations, suggestions, uh, but we're trying to do the best. This actually request came from the library because someone had come in. So Sandy took about you know 20 minutes to develop this document. Again, just a different way to distribute information. Yeah, if, if I may, I just think that's another great example, Derek, of all of the work that's being done at Town Hall to try to encourage participation, engagement, transparency, and information flow out to the citizens. So that's just one of many examples, but I think a key thing is the videos that have been posted on the town website with particular issues is really important. So I just wanted to highlight that again. Those videos are available on the town website for people to look at, um, and I think it's a really important way to get informed prior to the town meeting. So. More yeah, great work. If you go right to the home page, it's the, it's the link, the top link right at the top. You click on that, it'll take you to all this information in, yeah. one, in one place. So you don't have to search through the website for it all. So. Yeah, I thought they were very well made, uh, very informative, and it's only three to four minutes each one. So yeah. it's well worth the few minutes out of your day. Yeah, and we've had folks who said who have said to me, he goes, I'm an informed town meeting member, and that those videos answered a lot of questions I would have had. So it was good to hear from yeah. folks that typically attend town meeting. Um, so moving on. Annual reports are out. We just came in last week, I think. So if folks want an annual report, we have plenty of them to be picked up. They're also online. And then the FinCom reports are also out. So we have 300 finance community reports. Um, we're expecting, we're hoping to, to see more people at town meeting than typically. Typically, we have about 150. So um, if you take one, please take the one that you take from town hall to town meeting. So, you know, we don't have enough to keep, you know, giving people multiple copies. So, but again, this is also online, so you can always print a copy at the house. So, um, everything is currently available. Um, as far as some, some work that's happening, you're going to, I've been talking a lot about it. Dennis Westgate's been talking a lot about it. You're going to see over a million dollars worth of uh, road work done and then during the course of the summer. That's going to start this week. Uh, we're working on getting the message boards out there. So we have a lot going on right now, and I know a lot of folks love the message boards. Uh, we're using the, mess the message board right now to promote um, Town Cleanup Day and Park Serve Day. So that's out there. Once, once that is over, we're going to start using the message boards to promote town meeting and the election. But we also, in between all that, we have roads that we have to message. We have to let people know that we're closing roads down. So. Chief DeFranco is going to reach out to a couple of neighboring communities to see if we can steal their message boards. Because right now we can't, we need at least five message boards in order to cover all those bases. So, uh, but we know people like them, so we're not trying to prioritize which one's more important. But that being said, Westboro Road in the next two days is going to start getting uh, mill and overlay. Um, <clears throat> that's going to take about a week to accomplish, and it's going to go from the point of South Row Road to the power lines. So that's going to take about four days. And then in addition to that, concurrently to that, half of that north where they um, put the water main in and then the laterals, that has to be repaved. So um, they're just going to they're gonna do that in the next week or so as well, repave that area. So we're going to start to see a little congestion, especially in the mornings when folks are commuting back and forth. They're not going to stop that work until 9 a.m., but yeah, as you can remember last year, we still had backups on that road. Yeah. That paving that they're doing on the um, Hartford Ave North, is that like a temporary thing or is it part of the final project for the town? On Hartford Ave North? Or is that that's like just temporary. That's just because the trench, you know, during the course of the winter, it sinks. So they need to rip it out and they need to repave it because that section of, of the TIP project, if things go well, we won't break ground until that section until 2021. So we're going to need that. And we actually haven't paid um, our entire cost to the water main project until that paving is complete. 
that's the final, that's the last phase of it. Is there a list of all the streets in uh, Upton that are going to get paved this year? Yes. So um, I asked, because again, I predicted that question would come up. Um, we have a list and we can certainly put this online. I just always like to put a disclaimer that, you know, weather makes us change, you know, our, our rhythm and, you know, unexpected, unexpected uh, things will also cause us to change what we have listed. But we've listed Westboro Road, East Street, Brook Street, Piccadilly Street, Walker Drive, Church Street, Russell Ave, South Street, Kiwanis Beach Road, Glen Ave, and Pease Road um, as the first 14 streets that I desperately need to be milling all the way. So, uh, but again, some of those may come off and some other ones may go on. But we can, again, we can certainly put that. And then one other question, I'm yep. going to jump back to the tip project. Are you going to finish the gas line this year going up? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So, right, that's going to cover from the from the pond all the way up to the Hopkinton line. They need to complete that project as well. You know when that's starting? Um, I'm not quite sure, sure when that's that starting yet. Yeah. I haven't heard that they're starting that anytime soon though, because we yeah, just right. talked about that this morning. So They're behind yeah. schedule on that one. They were supposed What's to finish that? that last year. They were supposed to finish it last December. Yeah. yeah. But then they had the problem up in Lawrence and Andover. They had to move all their resources because of all the gas main explosions. So they've been up there, which has delayed the completion of the pro project down here. Um, speaking of TIP, uh, letters went out last week to uh, approximately 45 abutters. Uh, they received a letter which was a letter that was put together and it was, it was specifically for each, it wasn't just a template letter, it was a, it was a letter that was specific to each individual. Um, and it, in the letter, these abutters, they understand how much the town is willing to pay them for their permanent or temporary easement. Um, and it shows them a map of the easement area. Now, some, we've gotten a lot of phone calls, so that's why I'm talking a little bit about it, because some folks are calling to say, well, I thought you were putting a wall up. I thought you were putting a fence up. And you, know, what happened, you still have the tree showing. So that, the design is still in the design of the plans, which is online, the 100% design. The map that we, show, that we sent to folks is just the map of the easement, the, the layout of where the town is going to be taking, again, permanent or temporary. So, uh, again, just trying to explain that to folks. I thought it would be smart to talk a little bit about it tonight as well, uh, given the number of questions that we've received. Um, and then, so that was phase one, and then by the end of June, so for those folks that didn't get letters, the phase two letters, which um, are the area from the pond down to the um, West Upton intersection, those letters will go out in June. Um, and then lastly, I just want to report the treasurer collector had some interesting information today. Um, he is working on 45 properties in tax title. And um, he suggests that that's the taxes due to the town from those 45 properties is worth $756,000. Um, so he's pursuing those through tax title. Um, he said there is some property up in North Street that uh, we'll learn more about, you know, by the middle of the summer that's assessed at over $800,000. So as you recall, the town took a property on Westboro Road so about a year and a half ago, that was 12 acres of land that's assessed at $400,000. And so there's additional land that if the current property owner doesn't um, pay up, um, then the town will be taking that land, again, assessed at $800,000. So those are just some interesting pieces of information. Um, if the town were to take those, certainly, uh, we'd have to consider, you know, the disposition of those properties in, in the long term, potentially hold another auction like we did a year, a year ago. What was the total number of properties? You said the total tax over the 45 time. properties that are currently in tax title. And the taxes owed with the interest is uh, valued at $656,000. And so he's working with an attorney to try to move those through land court. And um, lastly, because if we don't meet on May 7th, the carnival is uh, uh, scheduled to begin on May 9th over, over at the VFW parking lot. Carnival May 9th. Yep. Be there. That's it. Thank you, sir. Just quickly on the tip. Um, so what is scheduled for this year on the tip? We are get pushed back a year? Right. So there will be no construction relative to the tip project in calendar year 2019. 
It's been moved from phase one, which is from the Hopkinton line down to West Pearl Road. Uh, that, in, that new intersection is slated to start construction in the spring of 2020. Okay. With the exception of the gas line? The gas line, right. Yeah. Did they say why it got pushed back or anything? Uh, it's mostly for timing. So the state told us they weren't going to go to bid on the project until this summer. And so, as you know, the bidding process takes a couple of months. So they, they predict by the time they award the contract to the, the best bidder, um, it won't be until late fall. And so given the winter months, they don't predict the contract to start until, until the fall, the following spring. Yeah. So it's basically a timing issue. If we were hoping to go out to bid. We originally were supposed to go out to bid in October of 2018. That's when we were supposed to go out to bid, which would have brought us to the spring of 2019 construction period. So I'll, I'll basically our bid, the state's bid got delayed nine months. Are they still doing 140 this year? Paving or? So the state has their own tip project from William Street down to Brook Street, down through 140. And right now they, they've hired an engineering firm to do an analysis of that span to look at the width of the road to see where they can widen sidewalks and then where they can put uh, bicycle lanes in and then they just do a simple mill and overlay. Yeah, it looked like the, uh, somebody was doing some work at uh, 140 in Menden Street. It looks like they're doing something with the curbs. So I didn't know if yeah, that was like they fixed the corners of the, uh, where the curb blends yeah. on the street there. It looked like they fixed that today. And you asked a question about the intersection of Maine and Hartford Ave South. Yes. That, um, according to Mr. Westgate, that is part of the TIP project. They're going to, they're going to square that off part of the TIP project. That's weird how that telephone pole sits right in the middle of the intersection. And right. Now that they're building the Pulte development up there, there's a lot more traffic coming down Hartford Ave South. So just the, and that's, that's like another pinch point, kind of like Farm Street, as you go around the corner right there. Yeah, they said they're going to square that off during the TIP project. So hopefully that'll get, look, that'll start in 2021. Yeah, 2021. Be interesting to see how this is going. quickly the state moves on 140 where the tip project's been delayed a year uh, just be interesting to see hopefully that won't get done before phase one of the tip project but who knows and that's article 10 regarding snow and ice so for folks listening at home or folks in attendance that number is going to move from 200,000 down to 52,000 so that'll, that'll help our numbers Right. Anything else for the Mr. Town Manager? Great work as always. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, you guys have any new business? No. And then, uh, just to look <coughs> for look ahead topics, we have uh, the closure of Warren Street and dog parks. And I guess it'll be that guy's uh, tree again. Mr. Combs, who wants to donate a tree. So, any public comment, questions? I did have uh, one thing real quick. I believe it's, uh, I was looking through, I believe it's Article 35. Um, a resident had asked me about uh, there's some change in verbiage and how we're going to post our uh, annual town warrant. Um, so somebody had asked me about the post office. And as far as I understand, we will still be posting that, a copy of that, at the post office each year. Right, but it won't be in the it won't be in the bylaw. It won't be required. It won't be a requirement we, in the bylaw. Okay. We can, as a courtesy, so it doesn't have to be posted at a certain time. Okay. But as a courtesy, we will. Okay. I had some I residents say, that had that's, some. That's the key, I think, is that we will, not that we could, we will. Because I think we're all make, we all want to make sure that that warrant continues to be posted at the post office. This just avoids Sandy having to run at the 11th hour to make it from us approving the warrant and racing down to the post office at the 11th hour to get it posted by a certain time. We'll make sure it's up there, though. Okay. Sounds good. good. Um, and Henry, so if I understand this right, so it would change, it, you wouldn't be required the seven days prior to the annual and the 14 days of No, we still have a posting requirement by as far as the, the, the time in which you have to warn the community okay. but what we're saying is that the requirement we're taking away the requirement that it has to be posted within the seven days 
at the post office. So we'll still have to post at town hall. The website will now be considered a legal posting, as will town hall. And I don't. And I think it's just those two are the legal postings. The website and town hall are two legal postings. The courtesy postings will continue to be at the library and continue to be at the post office. And what is the what's the hearing down? I think open meeting law says that uh, if the website is down for more than six hours, then it has to be posted someplace else. What is the contingency? Town hall. Town hall. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, and I think this year we demonstrated that we'll post it anywhere, you know. I, I know that some folks have posted it at the coffee bean, you know, so we're more than happy to post anywhere folks want it, but as far as what our legal obligations are, we've run into problems where, you know, like when Simon's mentioned, where Cindy's literally running out the door because the post office closes at, you know, 4.30, and she had to get inside the door by 4.30 in order to, so we're just trying to avoid, you know, things that are beyond our control. Anything else? Mr. Mayor, you might want to point out that the Finance Committee will be here tomorrow night to answer any questions regarding the budget and the water. I, I don't know how I missed that. Right, so tomorrow night is the, uh, the annual, it's on the top here too, the annual uh, budget hearing the Finance Committee is going to hold. It'll be in this room at 7 p.m., correct? All right, we'll make a motion to adjourn. And I would encourage anybody that has questions to come tomorrow night and ask those questions. And if you want to ask the questions again, you can come to town meeting and ask the questions again. Um, we certainly encourage people to ask questions in any forum or at any time based on whatever their inclination is. So we support engagement at all levels, certainly tomorrow night, but also at town meeting. So we appreciate people's engagement and questions. Mm -hmm. Very good. Make a motion to adjourn. Uh, make a motion to adjourn. Second. It's unanimous action. Thank you.